Christmas Eve, 1945, West Virginia, 10 p.m. The Sauter family was getting ready for bed, or rather, they were supposed to be. Marion, the oldest Sauter girl at 19, had landed her first job a few months back. After saving up for several weeks, she'd bought presents for three of her little sisters, Martha, Jenny, and Betty. The kids had been so excited that getting into bed had been a lost cause. In the end, their mom, also called Jenny, decided to just let them stay up past their bedtime. Exhausted in the way that only a parent can be the night before Christmas, she milled around the house doing the last spots of housework before bed. They had nine of their ten children home for Christmas. They had to choose their battles. Her husband, George, shattered from a hard day's work, had already taken himself off to bed. But 10 p.m. was Jenny's cutoff point. Finally collapsing into her bed in the room with two-year-old Sylvia, Jenny couldn't help but smile at the muffled sound of their children laughing and playing from the lounge. They'd head up to the attic bedroom soon enough, but for now she just wanted to drift off to sleep. Little did she know that her perfect night was just hours away from descending into a nightmare that would last the rest of her life, a tragedy so profound that it would be immortalized in the obituary of two-year-old Sylvia asleep in the crib. Decades later in 2021, the obituary read, an unsurpassed wife and mother, Sylvia had an infectious laugh and a delightful sense of humor. She had been preceded in death by her husband, granddaughter, three brothers, and sister. Five other siblings were unable to be located following the fire that occurred in December 1945 in their Fayetteville home. Maurice, Martha, Louis, Jenny, and Betty. Jenny woke up with a start. Smoke. It was curling through the gaps around her bedroom door, a kind of darkness that was somehow much blacker than the shadows in the room. Parental instinct kicked in almost right away. She rolled out of the bed and was at the crib in an instant, snatching up little Sylvia and running for the door. The clock ticked calmly away in the corner of the room, blissfully unaware that for the Sauter family, time had forever frozen in their minds at this exact moment. Half past one. Jenny sprinted toward the source of the smoke, peering around the room into George's office and seeing the telephone line and fuse boxes both engulfed in flames. She turned and ran to fetch her husband, barging into George's room and shaking him awake. The shout went up all through the house. Fire! Fire! Stumbling out into the freezing night air, George and Jenny looked around to see far too few of their children. Sylvia in Jenny's arms, Marion who'd brought the presents, John and George Jr., their oldest sons. But where were the little ones? Where were the kids? In unison, the parents looked up helplessly at the attic, the room in where all five of the others had slept. There was nothing for it. George sprinted back into the house, throwing a hand across his mouth to shield it from the smoke. He was met almost instantly with a wall of searing flame where the staircase used to be. His stomach lurched. They were trapped up there. Running back outside, he rounded up his two boys to help him. They were to get the ladder and scale the side of the house, but where was it? They always left it in the exact same spot, but it was gone. Okay, in that case, they'd fight the fire themselves. George ran to the water butt that collected rainwater. It was frozen solid. Cursing and desperate, he started to scale the side of the house himself, smashing a window in the process and slicing his arm badly on the glass. The smoke and loss of blood were making him dizzy, but he couldn't stop trying. Meanwhile on the ground, Marion was trying to contact the fire department. She ran inside to use the nearest phone, but the line was dead. No help at all. Running across to the neighbor's house, she pounded down the door and rushed in, snatching their phone off the receiver. Nothing. In the black winter night, the burning house cast terrifying shadows in all directions. George was back on the ground, running around barefoot on the ice with a new idea in his mind. He had a couple of trucks that he used for work parked up the street. He'd reverse one of them back up to the front of the house, climb onto the roof, and reach the attic from there, except neither truck would start. He'd been using them just fine only a few hours before. They had plenty of fuel, and they were in great condition, yet neither truck would start. A crunching, crashing sound filled the air. The night sky burned a brighter orange as sparks erupted. Half the house had collapsed. With nothing left to do but stand and stare, George climbed out of the truck and stumbled over to his wife in a daze. The six solders just stood there and watched for 45 minutes as their house burned down, with five of their own inside. The fire department didn't arrive until 8 a.m. A full seven and a half hours later, Jenny smelled the smoke. A passing motorist had to go all the way to the center of town to find a working telephone. The fire department then had to daisy chain calls, contacting each other one at a time before finally mobilizing and arriving at the scene. By the time they did, there was little for them to do other than poke around through the ashes of where the house used to be, as the Sauter parents watched on helplessly. But after two hours of searching, Fire Chief Morris approached the family with a confused look on his face. Nowhere in the ashes could he or his crew find any trace of the missing children. They couldn't have been in the attic. Maurice, Martha, Louis, Jenny, and Betty were missing. And all of a sudden, the gears in Jenny Sauter's head began to turn as she remembered all the mysterious things that had been happening to the family all week. 
After all, waking up to the smell of smoke hadn't been the first thing that had woken her up that night. For almost 40 years, if you were to drive through Fayetteville, West Virginia, you couldn't miss the striking billboard on prominent display right next to Route 16. Thousands upon thousands of motorists would have seen it over the years. On it were the faces of the five children who had gone missing that Christmas Eve night. Their photos were black and white, the children all looking anything from forlorn to bored to angry. $5,000 reward for anyone who has new information. The $5,000 was soon replaced with $10,000. Included were the contact details for George and Jenny Sauter, who over the years received all number of tips and scraps of info about their children's whereabouts. Both of them were first-generation Italian immigrants. Fayetteville may seem like a random part of America for both of them to land in, but in the first half of the 20th century it was home to a thriving, if a little small, Italian community. George Sauter had originally been Giorgio Sodu, but opted for a more Americanized name when he arrived at Ellis Island in 1908 at just 13 years old. He picked up a bit of work on the railroad in Pennsylvania, making a name for himself as a hard-working laborer before finding work in West Virginia. Before long, he had started up his own trucking company and had established a real name for himself in the area. That was until you asked him about his past and why he'd come to America in the first place. To that, George would freeze over and wait for you to move the conversation on quickly. He met his wife Jenny Cipriani at a music store that her father owned. Jenny had been in the US since she was just three. To her, America was the only home she'd ever really known. The pair of them married and moved to Fayetteville. In 1923, they had their first child and didn't stop until their tenth 20 years later, little Sylvia. Fayetteville was a small town, and it still is, really. And so this family of 12 held quite a prominent position in the community, particularly the Italian community, which was more segregated at the time than today, thanks to the racial and political tension swirling around World War II. George did not hold back from sharing his views. Politics, economics, right and wrong, he was not afraid of being outspoken and making it known what he believed in. If you ever were to pick out an example of the American dream, the Sauter family would be it. Until that dream became a nightmare. In the days following that fire, George and Jenny sat together and tried their best to piece together what had happened and what on earth could have caused it. And the more they talked, the more they remembered, the more their blood ran cold. Let's start at the basics. Where had the fire started? Well, from Jenny's memory of the night, it had seemed to be coming from the spot in George's office where the telephone line entered the house right by the fuse box. Almost immediately, George interrupted her. That fuse box was new. They had it installed when they had got the new electric oven just a few weeks ago. It was a local electrician who'd done it, someone whom George had known for years. Jenny tried to proceed with her story, but George interrupted her again. He wasn't finished. Because a couple of weeks after that, there'd been another workman at the house. Even though that guy was working on something totally different, He'd insisted that George take him around the back of the house to show him the new fuse box. The workman took one look at the fuse box and blew out his cheeks. That thing's gonna cause a fire someday. Who was that workman? Was he someone George had worked with before? George shook his head. Why did he want to look at the fuse box? George shrugged. An uneasy air settled over the couple as they sat in silence a moment. Then Jenny sat up straighter suddenly. Hang on, what about the insurance man? It took George a second to remember what she was talking about, but his eyes widened as soon as he remembered. Around a similar time, a door-to-door -door salesman had come to the house, an Italian guy trying to push some new insurance package on them. George had been the one to speak to him and refused. All of a sudden, things got heated. The insurance man started shouting at him, berating and even threatening him. What was it that he said again? Jenny asked, already knowing the answer. Your house is going to go up in smoke and your children are going to be destroyed. Again, the pair sat in silence. Then George finished the sentence. You're going to be paid for all the dirty remarks you've been making about Mussolini. The man hadn't been wrong. The Second World War had broken out and Mussolini's fascist politics had been dividing the Italian population. A staunch believer in the American dream and US values, George had been one of the most outspoken members of their community against the dictator. This had ruffled a few feathers, sure, but these things all had to be coincidences, right? But then what about the incident that had happened just a few days ago as the children were coming home from school? One of the older boys had told his parents that there had been a car parked by the side of the road with a man watching the kids intently. The official report of the events did little to comfort them. The fire was attributed to faulty wiring, and the missing children were ruled dead. Death certificates were issued. A funeral was scheduled, but Jenny and George were not buying any of it. Unable to handle all the questions swirling around their heads, George and Jenny were desperate for action. They'd been told by the police that they weren't allowed to return to the burnt-down wreckage yet, but they did so anyway. Amongst the ashes, they found melted kitchen appliances, still recognizable for what they originally were. 
If those had survived the flames, how was it possible that there wasn't a trace of any of the children? Frustrated by the lack of answers from the fire department and not trusting them after they delayed their response, Jenny started to conduct her own experiments. She would buy cuts of animals from the butchers, bones still in, and throw them into roaring fires. Try as she might, no matter how aggressive the flames were and how long the bones were in for, they wouldn't burn down. She learned that burning at 2,000 degrees, it would take a human skeleton two hours to be reduced to ash. Her home had burned down in just 45 minutes. They called in a telephone repairman to check the phone lines to the house. Why hadn't they been able to make a call to the fire department that night? The repairman took one look at the wiring and told him it was quite simple. The phone line hadn't burned, it had been cut. As they were poking through the ashes, a neighbor approached. He'd seen a man on the street near George's trucks with a block and a tackle taken from a vehicle's engine. Could that man also have got the phone wire? Also, where was that ladder? It had been outside in its usual spot last they remembered. After searching the area for a bit, George finally found it at the bottom of an embankment, 75 feet from the house. Neither he nor any of the members of his family had put it there. And lastly, to the matter of the cause of the fire. The report said that it was down to faulty wiring. The electrical cables in the house, the ones in the fuse box, had sparked and set off a blaze. That explanation would make sense, it would match with Jenny's memory of the incident, except for one crucial detail. The Christmas lights had still been on. If the fuse box had blown, the power to the whole house would have cut out. So why was the Christmas tree still lit up as the house was burning down? There was much more to the story from that night. As we said earlier, the moment Jenny woke up smelling smoke, it wasn't the first time she'd woken up that night. Christmas Eve 1945, West Virginia, 12.30 a.m., one hour before the fire. Jenny Sauter wakes with a start. A shrill ring is coming from the hallway outside her room. She rolls over bleakly staring at the clock in the corner of the room. Who on earth would be calling at this time of night on Christmas Eve? She quickly tied her gown around her waist and shuffled out to the hall, closing the door quickly behind her so as to not wake little Sylvia. Hello? It's noisy on the other end. The line's not great and it's difficult to make out what's happening through all the noise. A female voice speaks to her vaguely as shouts of laughter boom in the background. She thinks she can hear the sound of clinking glasses. The woman asks to speak to a name Jenny doesn't recognize. She replies curtly that the woman must have the wrong number. The woman laughs. It's a shrill, strange laugh that gets under Jenny's skin, like the woman is mocking her somehow. Jenny hung up the phone, shaking her head and tutting. She was just about to return to bed when she spotted something strange out of the corner of her eye. The light was on downstairs. The whole bottom of the house was lit up brightly. She glanced into the kitchen and lounge, lights on, curtains wide open. That was odd. Usually the kids were very diligent with closing the curtains and turning off the lights when they went up to bed. It wasn't like them to leave the house lit up like that. In the lounge was Mary and crashed out asleep on the couch. The others must have all taken themselves up to bed and left her there. Quietly as she could, so as to not disturb her daughter, Jenny closed the curtains and switched off the lights. But just before she went back to bed, she checked one more thing. Sure enough, the front door was unlocked. Jenny twisted the key slowly in the lock, peering out into the dark, snowy night. Nothing. She snuck back into her room with Sylvia, took off her robe, and slid back into bed, closing her eyes and letting sleep overtake her again. 1 a.m., 30 minutes before the fire. A banging noise wakes Jenny again. Her eyes snap open and she listens to the sounds from the roof of the house. It sounded like something hard and heavy falling onto the roof. She listens as whatever it is rolls along the roof steadily from one side of the room to the other, then silence. She keeps her eyes open for a couple of minutes, listening intently. Nothing. It must have been an animal or something. She closes her eyes and falls back to sleep, blissfully unaware that the next time her eyes open, it'll be too late for her to save her home from burning to the ground. What had that object been that had rolled along the roof of the house that night? Maybe it would still be there. And sure enough, while Sylvia was playing around in the backyard, she found a large, heavy rubber object that looked totally alien to her. She didn't recognize it as any part of her house. George took it in his hands, turning it over and examining the object closely. It's a pineapple bomb. Napalm. Despite the family's best efforts, the local police and fire departments wanted little to do with them. No one was particularly interested in reopening the case, despite their pleas. Out of desperation, they wrote to the president himself, begging that the FBI get involved as there seemed to be a conspiracy against their family. J. Edgar Hoover penned a reply stating, Although I would like to be of service, the matter related appears to be of local character and does not come within the investigative jurisdiction of the Bureau. The FBI would have been able to step in to assist the local police department if they wanted to, but the police refused. Increasingly paranoid and mistrusting of the authorities, the couple had hired a private investigator to look into the officials involved in the case. C.C. Tinsley took on the job, and it wasn't long before he came back to George Sauter with a familiar face, one of the men who had been on the panel that had concluded 
that the fire was caused by faulty wiring was a man they recognized right away. It was the salesman who visited the house and told George that it would burn down for what he said about Mussolini. Stranger than that was F.J. Morris, the fire chief, who had responded to the scene. Morris had spoken in private to others about a discovery he'd made at the scene, a heart. Rather than tell the family about the discovery, Morris had it hidden quickly, placing it in a dynamite box and burying it at the scene. After some persuasion, Tinsley convinced Morris to return to the scene and dig up the box. He did so, much to their surprise. The heart was taken from the box and given to a local expert who deemed that it was, in fact, not a heart, but a piece of beef liver. What had that been doing at the scene of the crime? Well, Tinsley later heard rumors that Morris had planted the evidence there in hopes that the Sodders would accept it as proof of their children's deaths and drop the case. Four years later, the Sodders, still without any answers, launched a new search into the site. They excavated much of the land that George Sodder had buried under five feet of dirt to act as a memorial. This time, they did find something. Vertebrae. Four shards of a human spine. The Sodders sent the shards to the Smithsonian Institute right away for examination, but the report raised as many questions as it answered. You can tell someone's age fairly accurately from their vertebrae. At 23, they fused together partially. They had not. Judging from their size and the gaps between them, they would have belonged to a 16 or 17-year-old. The oldest Sodder child to have disappeared in the fire was 14-year-old Maurice. He wasn't so big for his age that these could be his. What's more is there was no signs of fire damage anywhere on the shards. They were all too well preserved to have been the final remains of a destroyed body. More likely, they had been separated from the rest of a corpse. In all likelihood, these bone shards were present in the dirt that George Sodder had piled onto the site. A breakthrough came when a man was arrested. The one who had been seen with the block and tackle on the road was identified and detained. He confessed to stealing the block and tackle, and when pressed on whether he had cut the phone line to their house, he freely admitted he had done that too. He claimed that he actually had been trying to cut the power line, but got the wrong one. Why he was trying to cut the power to their house is sadly unclear now. The man was released, and no record of the details of his arrest can be found. The woman who called on the night of the fire was also found. She was brought in for questioning and her story checked out. She had been celebrating with friends and genuinely called the wrong number. There was nothing more to it than that. A bus driver soon came forward and seemed to back up Jenny and George's theory about the napalm bomb being used. He had been driving by on that night and had seen from a distance what appeared to be a man throwing a ball of fire at their house. Again, this lead never went anywhere. By the time it was shared, it was far too late for investigators to verify if that was indeed how the fire started. This leaves us still with the question central to all of this. What happened to the children? Maurice, 14, Martha, 12, Louis, 10, Jenny, 8, and Betty, 6. Not a trace of any of them was found in the remains even after all of the work. Had the children been taken? If so, how, where, and why? Theories amongst the family and followers of the case have run rampant for decades. The children who went missing were all downstairs in the house when their parents went to bed. The front door was unlocked and the lights were still on. Perhaps with Marion asleep on the couch, a person had entered the house and taken them. It couldn't have been by force, the noise would have woken Marion and Jenny. Perhaps it was someone they knew, or someone so immediately threatening that they held their tongues. Perhaps the children ran away from the fire once it was burning and were kidnapped before their parents had time to get out of the house. Perhaps the arsonists wanted to send a message. Rather than kill the entire family, the children weren't at fault for their father's sins so they should be spared. So they were taken away before the fire starts. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps that's all the Sodders ever had to go on. One witness claims to have seen the children in the back of a car leaving the house earlier that night. Another witness reported seeing one of the children in a car with Florida plates. Another saw a set of Italian adults with a group of children, all looking very similar at a hotel. The adults grew angry when the hotel worker tried to talk to the children and pulled them away. Photos were sent to the family of people in New York who looked like older versions of the children. For years, George would drive all over the country. Any lead or scrap of new information that came through, he would go to investigate personally. Not one of them ever went anywhere. All of the remaining children kept up the investigation except for John, who was at odds with his family wishing they would just accept what had happened and move on. One by one, George, Jenny, Mary and John and George Jr. all died until it was just Sylvia left. Even in her old age, little baby Sylvia would engage with online message boards theorizing about what had happened. Her earliest memory in life was the sight of her father covered in blood from gashing his arm on the glass, blackened from smoke, running around in a panic. Sylvia passed away in 2021. In all their lives, none of the Sodders ever found out what happened to the five missing children. 
Sadly, it seems to be a mystery that we'll never get to the bottom of. All that we can hope is that Maurice, Martha, Louis, Jenny, and Betty didn't perish in that attic choked by smoke and cowering in flames. We can only hope that it was true that they did somehow escape the blaze and that they went on to live full and happy lives. We can hope. Now check out Kid School Bus Mysteriously Disappears, or watch this video instead.